2019 was an astounding year for anime. There were so many good shows that when I made my best of the year list, I forgot one in a brain fart that I've been upset about for weeks. And that's High Score Girl. <laughs> Now, if you were to ask me, I would say that Netflix is extremely hit or miss with their anime exclusives. I loved Knights of Sidonia, Castlevania, and Devilman Crybaby, but others left a sour taste in my mouth for sure. However, High Score Girl isn't just one of my favorite Netflix anime or favorites from 2019. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's a story about youth, love, friendship, and most importantly, video games. It's also a period piece and honestly, while the main characters would be a little bit older than myself at this point, it's as if the show was literally made for me. So much love and attention to detail was put into this production that unfortunately is lost on many people who weren't there. But while it may not grip the average viewer at episode 1, its core themes are universal and speak to the youth in our hearts. But anyway, I feel like I've deliberated enough for an intro, you're still here, so without further ado, let's get into High Score Girl. The story of High Score Girl is 100% dependent on its setting, which is Japan in 1991, specifically in the arcades of Tokyo. The show opens up with a young boy named Haruo who is infatuated by the brand new Street Fighter 2. However, there is a young girl named Akira Ono in the arcade who is destroying any and all contenders using Zangief, a notoriously difficult character to use effectively. In just a few minutes, everything we need to know is set up. Haruo hates that a girl is exceptional at video games, especially a girl who happened to be rich, popular, kawaii AF, and top in his class. This makes Haruo look like a total douche and could be a reason some people may have turned this show off, but it's important to remember again that this is a period piece. Like, you think sexism is an issue now? In 91, it was so bad, it wasn't really even considered a problem. It was just ingrained. Boys played with action figures, girls played with dolls, that was the way it was, and stepping over gender lines was just not really a thing. Arcades, too, were a very different place at the time. First, they existed, uh, they were actually populated with people, generally weren't chains like Panzer Round 1, and had exceptional games coming out all the time. Consoles had just not caught up to the power of arcade cabinets yet, so if for cutting-edge gaming experiences, the arcade was the place to be. However, they also had a reputation for being a place for delinquents and hoods. They were dark, filled with cigarette smoke, sucked up most of your money, and were a great low-key place to deal drugs. It's also important to mention some elephants in the room. A. This is an odd semi-3D art style. A lot of people are turned off by 3D anime, and I'm not sure why. I don't see it taking over the medium ever, so when anime happens to be 3D, it doesn't bother me unless it sucks, and this one doesn't at all. It's bright, colorful and expressive, and I love the way it looks. Second, Akira doesn't talk ever. I never felt like it took away from the narrative or diminished her character in any way. In fact, there's a lot of ways this choice could be interpreted. The first is that Haruo is a pubescent boy, a creature that naturally has difficulty grasping the nuances of what a female is. He's also a nerd on top of that, making his issues understanding girls that much worse. However, it could also be a commentary on the gaming scene as a whole, where often women aren't really given a voice. It takes a long time for Haruo and the audience to get a grasp on exactly what it means to be Akito Ono, because she doesn't talk, but that very well may be the point. Anyway, as this young girl dunks on challenger after challenger, Haruo gets more and more annoyed until he challenges her himself and proceeds to get his nuts curb stomped over and over again. Finally getting desperate enough, he challenges her one last time, and in their first bout, he uses a legit real-world technique called guile turtling to beat her. It's a cheap and scummy thing to do in SF2, but what's really astounding is the actual high-res 60 frames per second gameplay footage from an actual Capcom game in an anime. Capcom isn't the only company that allowed for their footage to be used in the anime as well. Many others signed on. Apparently there were legal issues with SNK during the manga's production. Just a little fun fact for you otakus out there. Regardless, Haruo is shamed for being cheap and decides to make up for it by playing one-handed, a move we always called the claw hand where I'm from. Naturally, he gets destroyed, so he resorts to another scumbag technique called throw jank. Again, a real tactic and he beats her. Now the whole scene is hilarious with onlookers shaming him and face palming at his cowardice and it's amplified when the young girl Akira comes around the cab and punches Haruo right in the face for being a giant tool. 
Now, you see, it's important to note the use of Street Fighter here in the opening scene. This game was a revolution. While there were always competitive and cooperative arcade games, Street Fighter 2 marked the first time two players could truly battle it out with a clear and decisive winner in a fight. There wasn't so much of a score, instead a life bar which drained by your skill and your skill alone. It created a legitimate competitive scene unlike any that had ever been seen before in the video game world, and one that is still massively popular today. The arcade the arcade also had another significance that we no longer really experience today, a feeling of community in the gaming world. Haruo is described as being lazy, bad at school, and unattractive. Just kind of mean, but I didn't write it. However, the arcade was a place he could go to meet people and compete against them, a place where he could publicly shine and make friends. His encounter with Akira eventually turns into just that. As time goes on, instead of seeing her as just a girl, he begins to see her as his rival. Akira is truly amazing at video games. Her technique for alchemizing in Final Fight is next to impossible to pull off in real life, but she not only carries Haruo through the entire game, but she does it on one life and gets the high score. And eventually Haruo begins seeing Akira as not just a girl or a rival, but also as a friend that he respects. Ironically, their mutual love for video games affords them an activity to do together, unlike now where things are mostly online. Together they search out arcades and play together at Haruo's house on his brand new, PC engine. Now, I was a lucky kid growing up where I did. Up in New Hampshire, there's a place called Fun Spot, which happens to be the world's largest arcade. I have family up there, and I was able to regularly enjoy all the games the facility boasted. And at a campground upstate in New York, where my family used to vacation, was an arcade as well, and every year they'd swap out the caps. It was where I was able to cut my teeth on the new Marvel vs. Capcom 2 game and the X-Men arcade cap. But also, it was a place to make friends while I was on vacation. And back home, my friends and I could almost always be found playing video games together on console at home. The 90s was truly a great time for experiencing video games with other people in person. Unfortunately for the pair, Akira is forced to move away to LA right as her and Haruo are beginning their friendship. On the outside, Haruo is cold at first, but eventually he realizes that he's crushed by her leaving. He runs to see her off, spending the money he was given for a gift on his train pass. Instead, he gives her a plastic ring from the arcade that they used to go to together and talks about how he wishes he could play the new Fatal Fury game from SNK with her. When she breaks down, it becomes obvious that Haruo is also her only friend. And then there's a two year time leap. So by now, I'm sure it's no secret that I love video games. It's actually how I started YouTube back in early 2016, as a game reviewer. Later, I signed on as a full member of the True School team and still make gaming content there to this day. However, I've always felt that anime and video games go hand in hand. In fact, a lot of video games to me are just good interactive anime, like Final Fantasy XV or any JRPG for that matter. High Score Girl is a fusion of the two that no Gennaro Isekai could match, because it's a celebration of video games rather than simply stealing their themes. A lot of people see this show as nostalgia pandering, and as someone who works on a platform largely built on nostalgia pandering, I would have to disagree. High Score Girl is a love note to the arcade days and early home console era. Watching games grow and change while Haruo grows and changes very much mirrors exactly what it was like, and the excitement of new mind-blowing games like Virtua Fighter is palpable. Now in junior high, Haruo is creaming his pants about being able to throw Hadouken in class with his PC Engine GT or TurboGrafx Express when a new girl comes onto the scene. Hiraka doesn't know anything about video games, but she's got the gift. She also likes Haruo a lot, but again, he's a total nerd and just doesn't see it at all. Her character contrasts Akira by being the kind of person who enjoys the backseat. Also, she talks, so there's that. But despite her innate talent, Hidaka would much rather watch Haruo play than play herself, and just as their relationship begins to grow, Akira comes back. But hey, I don't want to spoil the whole thing for you, so let's take a look at some really awesome stuff about this show. While written around the classic arcade lifestyle, High Score Girl is primarily a coming of age and love story, and as time continues on, Haruo, Akira, and Hidaka all change and more is revealed about their life circumstances, especially for Akira who just doesn't talk. There's a ton of extremely heartwarming moments and a lot of comedy and even the dub isn't that bad. But something I haven't mentioned yet is one of the best gifts I came away with after my watch, and that 
is the music. Composed by Yoko Shimomura, the OST for this anime is above and beyond. If you haven't heard of Shimomura, she's a prolific video game composer, responsible for Final Fight and Street Fighter 2, but also for all of the Kingdom Hearts games, Mario RPG, Final Fantasy XV, among many others of note. That alone should show the care that was put into the production of this weird little anime, but what really caps it is the OP and the ED, pun intended. Sodotob Sakuna performs the OP, which is brilliantly animated, but also a total jam. It's J-pop over extremely impressive chiptune math rock. For fans of the show, you know I like music, but rarely talk about music within anime. So let me tell you, this OP sent me down a rabbit hole. I actually listen to Sorotob Sakuna on a regular basis now, and I recommend that you check them out. Their instrumentation is mind-boggling. And the outro is an odd haunting tune by Etsuko Yakushimaru. <laughs> called After School Distraction and warrants at least a million lessons. And lastly, one of the best things I was left with after watching this show was a renewed love for old school fighters. When the Nintendo Switch launched, there really wasn't a lot to play on it. It took a hot couple months for the big end to drop some more games, so early adapters were left with the eShop. During that time, I decided to pick up a bunch of Neo Geo fighters, and I've always loved fighting games, but I royally suck at them. However, after wrapping up my time with High Score Girl, I decided to pick up a fight stick and really dive into the technical aspect of these games with renewed vigor, and I've been having an excellent time. It's an avenue of entertainment I don't make content on, so it's really nice to simply enjoy some fighting games. Oh, and one last thing. When I was 21, I was going through a period of really big changes. Changes I don't want to get into yet, but I had been out of gaming and the internet for years at that point. During this time, I found myself with space and money to play games again, and I also met a girl. She was a huge Pokemon player, and I had really been into the first three installments, so I wanted to impress her. She asked me if I knew what Eevee training was. I told her it was training in Eevee. It's been seven years. We live together, and she never lets me live that down. Oh, and we play video games together all the time. She's my partner, my co-op teammate, and my rival, but also my best friend. It's definitely cheesy to say, but video games can really bring people together, and for Haruo, it started with someone he was raging at. For me, it started with a little bit of humiliation. But I'm amazed that someone made an anime that shows how deep relationships can form over mutual love for something like video games, and it's especially cool to watch it happen back in a time when gaming was exciting and communal and in person. Maybe High Score Girl meant more to me personally than it would to you, but it's still really fun to see the Japanese side of the early 90s. While in the States we were all playing on the Genesis or Super Nintendo, Haruo was playing on the PC Engine or Turbo Graphics, which is what we call it here. Later he picks up a Sega Saturn, which he loves so much he gets rusty in the arcade, while in the West we were mostly playing PlayStation at that point. It's a good sight into another culture, and fun fact, uh, the PS Vita actually did pretty well in Japan despite its brutal flop in the West. I don't know, I just thought you should know. And last but not least, High Score Girl Season 2 is currently out on Netflix in Japan, but we are still waiting for it in the States like usual. But if you haven't yet, you should hop on and watch the first season to experience one of my favorite anime ever. We'll also be covering Season 2 almost definitely, so it's worth getting into and getting stoked for that. And if you have someone special in your life, I recommend playing a game with them from time to time, even if they just like to watch. Memories are made by doing things together. Hopefully in the future we get more anime that is in the same vein as High Score Girl, something very video gamey that's not just an isekai that's like, you know, trying to be a video game. I like content about video games. Very, very cool. Anyway, thank you guys so much for sticking around to this point in the video. Uh, if you haven't noticed yet, our One Piece video was taken down. It's a real shame because me and Grant worked really, really hard on that and people were enjoying it and it was really taken off. But one of the things that we face as people who make anime content is dealing with Japanese companies and they can tend to be absolutely draconian about their intellectual properties. Now, obviously we are fighting this just like we always do. I almost guarantee you that the video will be put back up. The only problem is, is we're all going to have to wait 
until March. However, if you are interested in seeing that video, if you want to see it again, or if you haven't seen it yet, it is on our Patreon and all it costs to join is a dollar. I know that every YouTuber has a Patreon and I'm sure that you're sick of hearing about Patreon, but honestly, when it comes to financial stability, that is the absolute best way to help people like myself and the team out. It also helps protect us against aggressive companies that come in and try to take down our videos, even though One Piece was basically an ad for One Piece. There were so many people on that video that were like, oh, I'm gonna go watch One Piece now. It's ridiculous. So if you wanna help secure the future of this channel, and more importantly, our independence to make the content that we wanna make and you wanna see without fear of dealing with these companies, Patreon is the absolute best way to do that, and I really hope that you consider it. And with that spiel out of the way, I'd like to thank our super lucky patron of the week, and that is Dr. Dad. Dr. Dad, thank you so much for being our patron. You are the best, and honestly, your contributions are a huge help. Thank you so much. If you would like more Bonsai Pop content, I recommend following us on Twitter and Instagram. That is Bonsai underscore pop. We just received an excellent package from Bandai Namco, which I will be putting up an unboxing over there on Instagram at the very least. And Twitter, it's just a good way to keep up with me regularly. If you like this video, make sure that you check out our other ones or just throw on that Bonsai Pop Master playlist. My name's Mike. This is Bonsai Pop. And I'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>